Welcome to Flavor Bound's book review of Mastering Pasta by Mark Vetri. Go ahead. <laughs> Today we're drinking uh, Big Hugs. It is a Russian Imperial Stout uh, by Half Acre Brewing out of Chicago. So make sure you stay tuned after the episode. Uh, we're going to talk about the beer, review it, share our thoughts on that. Uh, it's a very special beer, but we wanted to pick something special for our, uh, for our first review. So... Uh, that's, Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So, Keith, why don't you talk about the, uh, the physical book itself? The physical book itself. Um, we're talking about a um, hardbound book, and the book itself contains 261 uh, pages with uh, a compilation of 77 dishes, uh, as opposed to a recipe. So what we mean by that is the book has uh, a dish. For example, uh, the first recipe that we went through was a capoletti uh, recipe but in that recipe there is a dough recipe a sub recipe so what we did is we counted um, each of the dishes in the book so there's 77 loaves and then there's a countless dough recipes sauce recipes you know things like that yeah so the the dough recipes the sauce recipes there were also um what else? There was recipes for like little um, garnishes, stuff like that. Those, those are something that we would consider a sub recipe. Um, again, the dishes would be the completed dish that you would right, eat, that, that you would serve, you, up. that you would serve. Um, and in a lot of books, it would just be absolutely crazy to count <laughs> sub recipes, especially in something like Eleven Madison Park, where one dish might have six different sub recipes or even 20 components even if it's just parsley which doesn't have a recipe but it's right. a component of the dish um it would just be crazy to count those so uh 77 dishes 261 pages um it is hardcover let's talk about the quality of it sure go ahead i, I mean the, the, the book itself um we like it it's a hardcover book and we talk about the, um, it's, it's kind of nice, it's very dense, very well, you know, sturdy type type book. You can have this up in the kitchen, no problems. Yeah, it's something that'll uh, certainly uh, weather. It's going to last, it's going to last a while. Yeah, it'll weather over time. Uh, the, Good binding. Oh yeah, so let's talk about the binding. This is something that I think is, is really, really cool. It's called lay flat binding, or some people call it perfect binding, perfect bound. Um, when you open the book it lays flat. So the pages don't do that. Is it gonna, is it gonna, oh, it's dead. gonna turn, it's gonna and turn, it, oh, how do yeah. I, how do I, what and do then I you put, find yourself I mean, trying to, you know, like take the book and do one of these jobs to, which is probably the worst thing you could do to a book. Like, don't do that, yeah. you'll break the binding, yeah. and and you ruin it, and then pages start coming out. Yeah, so, um, the it, it, it is Word a, of advice, don't do that. It has a, uh, it has a lay flat binding, <laughs> Um, one of the things that I think is pretty cool about the book is that it has a it has a sources section. So in the back, it has um, it has a sources section where it'll tell you to find hard to find ingredients like fresh truffles, um, stores to get uh, cheeses, meats, fish, vegetables, um, everything. Yeah, Which, you know, and that's a good thing for for guys like me, you know, home chefs like me that um, you know when somebody asks. Well, what did you make? Or I saw this that you made. Where did you get this? How do you know where to get that stuff? Well, the, the best answer to give people is, you know what, if it's in the book, that's a great thing. If it's not, you know, it's a learning experience. But when you have this in the book, that's like a huge selling point for a guy like me. So when I tell somebody, hey, this is um, um, the book that you should go get, well, how do I know where to get that? Well, especially things in in a high end in a, in a high end kitchen situation, um, you know, they're using ingredients that they may get from a very specialty supplier. Um, things like, like I said, like fresh truffles or fresh truffles or uni stuff like that. Foraged mushrooms, Ita Italian hams, you know, stuff like that. They just very imported items, you know, stuff like. Uh, yeah. So I mean, and we do live in the age of the internet. Amazon is going to be one of your best tools. If uh, you know if. If you don't find it on Amazon, you spelled it wrong. Yeah. I mean, I mean plain and simple. There's been very few, few things that we've 
been able to or not been able to find right. on Amazon. Uh, but something like this, a sources book, uh, a sources in the back of the book is a, is a great place to start, and you can source exactly the same thing uh, that they did, not a version of it. Or no, a different and, type and it's of directly it. directly from there. Yeah, the websites are there, and all these places. Yeah, this one has even street addresses, street yeah, address, it, phone, phone numbers, numbers, website, uh, and a, and a, and some of them a description. Again, great, great thing. Something I absolutely love in a book. Yeah. So that's the sources section. So uh, I think we should talk about you know who the book is for. So I think the book is for um, both the professional chef and and home cooks alike. Um, it does have a couple things that we'll talk about uh, when we talk about the actual uh, dishes that we cook. There are a couple things in there that I would say um, home cooks should be aware of. Um, but I would say that the, <laughs> but I think that the book is, um, geared, geared to both, uh, both, uh, you know, the home and professional, uh, chefs. Um, you know, it's got some, it's got some great dishes, stuff that, you know, uh, as a professional chef, I'll say, I like this idea and I will do my version of this, but as a home cook, you will make the recipes in here with a reasonable amount of ease. Though it's going to be tough if you've never made pasta before, this is a great. This book is a great learning tool, but there are certain things um, that you'll just need. You need to know, learn how to feel, learn how to see, and that comes with practice. You I was say, it, it, take, it takes time to learn some of that stuff, especially making pasta dough, because it isn't an easy thing to do. It looks easy. I think it's easy. Well, you know what? Somebody that does it for the first time. Um, Depending on how you do it, it, it can be very difficult. They're going to they're gonna look at it and go, wow, I'm going to make a mess doing this. I, and, and I think this book, the way it's laid out and the, uh, the language that it uses makes it very easy for the home person to follow it with relative ease. I think it's easy to make pasta dough. I want to I touch on this. I think it's easy to make pasta dough. I think it's hard to master pasta dough. Uh, well, we, and, and touch on that for a second. Let's, you know, go back. With all the different dough recipes in here, um, again, Mastering Pasta, that's his, that's the title of the book. Um, there are many variations of dough in this book. Yeah, so there's, so one of the chefs that I work for, um, a chef by the name of Gaetano Narduli at a near restaurant uh, in Barrington, Illinois. Um, go check him out. <laughs> awesome, awesome restaurant. Um, he has different recipes that he'll use, uh, certain doughs for filled pastas, some for rolled pastas, pastas, uh, for dried are certainly different than, uh, fresh pastas. Pastas made for extruding, uh, from like an arcobaleno machine or something like that are, are years different than, than a, a dough that say that you would and, use for rolling. And this book does go through all, all of, of them that. and the different types of doughs that you would use for, for, for ravioli, for example, for dried pastas for extruding for all of that stuff yeah so I, I certainly wouldn't want to scare anybody we don't, we don't i don't mean to do that but well, there are a lot of you can make pasta very easily but it will take time to perfect it and there are certain nuances as explained by this and work you know and to be perfectly honest if you took and there is a basic dough recipe in here if you took that basic dough you could make most of the, uh, the straight pastas in here, the filled pasta, you could easily do that without trying, you know, to go through every single one of them. Um, but again, if you want that, again, if you want that next level, right, then you, you'll start learning those things. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and as far as who the book is for, um, the equipment mentioned in the book is all pretty straightforward stuff. Nothing yeah. that you're going to need that's crazy. Um, I, I've read somebody make a comment. I can't buy the book because I don't have a pasta machine. That is so and not that's, true. That's absolutely 100% not true. If you got a rolling pin, you could you can make pasta. If and, you could squish dough, you can make pasta. And, and by the way, in the book, and it's not one that we covered, but there is a section in the book for hand-rolled pastas. So, you know, that's a completely false statement.
So let's talk about the recipes. The first one that we cooked was the Lardo Capoletti from oh. page 93 uh, with fava cream. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was in heaven. That was, probably, uh, that was probably the best thing I put in my mouth in a year, I, at least. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I was, you know, picking up a new book, and I'm not a, uh, I don't make pasta very often. Um, I, I can do it. Uh, this book takes it to another level, definitely. Um, but just putting this together and seeing how it was going to shape, you know, uh, come together, I was, it was, it was a look. When I opened the book, it was the one I wanted to do. It looks absolutely freaking tasty. It look. I, you want to eat the page. I'm sorry. It's that good. I mean... It, it looks that good. Hopefully you guys can see this pretty good, but I mean, this... Um, I mean, this picture is just beautiful. Um, and, and do we I, need to talk about the photograph quality of the book? You know what? We did, we did not. We did not. Um, I would just say, so, so we won't step backwards. We'll keep going with the Lardo. But I will say the photographs in this book are fantastic. I love the, the, the paper that it's on um, as opposed to like a matte finished paper. It's a gloss paper. Um, and all the, uh, the images are punchy, contrasty. Um, the colors are, are boomy. Um, I like it. I like the photograph quality of the book. So, but um, so back to the Lardo. Back to the back to the Lardo. And like I said, when when I when I took a look at this, this was the one I went. I want to make that. I, this was the one, and and it was. Uh, I, it wasn't difficult to put together. You look at this and go, "Wow, there's some exotic ingredient there." Lardo. What is Lardo? We'll save that for a whole another. Well, I think we can bring it. I mean, that's that, well, let's bring it up. So, uh, just. We don't have to go de deep in, but lardo is uh, the, is back fat uh, from a pig. From a pig, and while it doesn't sound delicious, I assure you it is. Um, it is the the back fat and that is um, it's a tougher fat uh, that is cured in salt and spices over long periods of time, as six months and beyond, and then shaved very uh, uh, thinly. Yeah, basically, basically, they coat it in this stuff, wrap it up, and they put it in a marble cask in a cave. And they let it. Is sit it marble? There. Is it like limestone? No, it's it's marble. The okay. tra traditionally, what I what I had read is it's done in marble. Okay. But then they let it sit in a cave for like six months. Yeah, uh, to maintain a uh, cool temperature. Yeah, the, the humidity and everything. And I'll say that you'll find an amazing recipe for that in Salumi by Ry Michael Rollman and Brian Polson. Oh, we've made that was actually the lardo that we used was homemade lardo that we did. Yep. Um, a year ago that's been uh, cryovac and then frozen oh, uh, on top beautiful. of the curing. That's not going bad. Beautiful. Um, it's beautiful. That's all and, I can say about yeah, that. Yeah, that recipe is killer. If you've got time, if you've got... Anyway. Backpack. Yeah, uh, so that's the lardo. Um, so, and now the, fi and, and the funny thing about it is, it would, <clears throat> the way we talk about lardo, that's actually the filling that goes into this pasta. It is a, Capoletti is a filled pasta. Um, and you take that... And pancetta. And pancetta. You take the pancetta, you take the, the back fat, and then the spices. Not lardo. No, this, this thing, you don't take lardo. No, you no, take, no. You take the... You take uncured pork fat correct. and puree it with pancetta. Pancetta and the spices that yeah. you would use for curing lardo. Yeah. So you put all that in together, whip it all up, and it makes this... Uh, an emulsified And it, it makes an emulsion. Correct. And uh, while... Well, your initial your initial thought here is that it's going to be greasy and and disgusting when it uh, when it comes out of that water. Oh, it was so pillowy and and it, uh, it was like oh it was umami. like it was, oh it was it was I I, I I smile thinking about it. It was so good. I, if you when you watch the video and at the end of it where I take a bite of it, you I'm sorry you can't help but smile. It was so good. Um, so any that's uh, so we talked about the taste though. I mean, we talk about the uh, issues. Were there Is any it, issues? No, uh, you know what? Um, personally, I didn't find that I had any issues following the recipes or following this particular recipe. Um, everything came together as it should. Uh, the fava beans. I will say this: if you've never done it before, they are a pain. That's why, um, so it's funny, my girlfriend, she was saying that the, when, as I was editing the video for the, for the dish, uh, that the scene of sh shelling the beans was too long, and I really wanted to convey, 
how long it takes to it, shell a ton of fava beans. It, it takes a long time. Yeah. And it was so that was the that was the purpose yeah, behind it. It's not fun, but my oh, the the end product. I'm telling you. So he it likes was, the recipe. Yeah, um, to say the least. Issues. We really didn't have anything uh, go wrong with it, with it. I will say that we both felt that the dough was a little bit soft. Um, I think it could have been either needed longer to develop the gluten in the dough a little bit more, uh, or maybe even just a touch less egg. Um, but that's getting super picky about it. It yeah. was a great, uh, rich egg I, I dough. Will, again, when, when it comes out of the water and you hit that first taste, it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, that's what pasta should taste like. It, it, I mean, it was unbelievable. And, uh, you know, as far as what we would do differently, I can't say with this one that I would do much differently. No. I, I thought this was fantastic. I, 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 thought this was, I thought this one was spot on. Um, one of the things that I think that Mark is not big on, because I don't see it in a lot of the recipes, is acid. I'm a huge proponent uh, uh, or a huge fan of using uh, sherry vinegar, lemon juice, a powdered acid like tartaric or citric acid. Um, I just something to brighten up your dish. It just brings food to life, uh, especially rich dishes like lardo capoletti. Yeah, um, and, then, and, and no, and that's that. That is key. This is a. It is a very rich dish. So when you put you put six or seven of them on a plate, that is all you need. Yeah, so I would say that I would, if there was something that I had to change or would suggest, is adding a few touch dashes of, of a touch of vinegar, maybe tossing the pasta in a little bit of olive oil and vinegar in a bowl before plating it, um, and that would just bring the whole dish to life. Yeah, as yeah as I agree. So, Keith, why don't you uh, start talking about the eggplant uh, rotolo? Uh, actually, so I'm going to go reset the cameras. Why don't you talk about cabbage, uh, the cabbage gnocchi video? And uh, we'll come back to the eggplant rotel. So why don't you start with... Uh, All right. So the, um, the, the way we dissected the book was we went through and I chose a recipe, David chose a recipe, and then we chose one together um, to make our, our, our three recipes from the book. So the third one that, that we decided on was a, uh, a cabbage gnocchi. And particularly, let me get the... It's cabbage gnocchi with sausage and toasted breadcrumb. I, I will say this. It was, um, when you look at it, 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 it doesn't look like much. Um, but as you're putting the dish together, what I would say uh, about this dish is that it's a, um, I would call it a peasant dish. And I think that's the best way to describe it. Uh, when you think about, you know, old world Italy, and, and I mean in old times, you know, what did people have? They had egg, they had bread, bread crumb, cheese, and, and that's the way that this dish is put together. Yeah, so there's not a lot of, of frills to this dish. Not uh, at it all. Was, it's very simple. It's bread, cabbage, sausage, egg. That's that's it. Um, and then you've got breadcrumbs. So again, bread. And uh, it's got a little bit of cheese grate over the top. Nothing crazy. We went yeah, nuts and, with the cheese. And, and, let's, and say, was, let's say this too, that, you know, traditionally when you're look, when, when somebody says gnocchi, you're thinking of potato. potato, flour, you know, and this is yeah, it's, not it's that a, at all. It's not a, t a t typical gnocchi. It's not gnocchi. a traditional gnocchi. I mean, well, yeah, it is. Well, highly it, it, actually, I, it, I, I said that incorrectly. It, it is traditional. But it's not what you would, your it's, preconceived notion correct. of what you think of when you think right. of gnocchi. But um, it was great, though. I mean, it was, it was something that I wanted to do because, um, you know, I thought it would be a different look. I just thought it would be a different look at gnocchi. Um, and I was curious to see how it came out. It, it came out... Um, like a soft dumpling. And almost like a dumpling. Almost like a dumpling, yeah. Um, so the dough itself, uh, or this, this you keep talking about the taste here. Initially coming out of the water, I didn't think they there tasted There was nothing like, there. I didn't think, I thought they were flavorless. I, 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 to be perfectly honest, I thought they were flavorless. I, um, here's what I, when I got out, when, I, when it came out and I picked it up, tasted it, it was, I got a touch of cabbage and then I got a little bit of the spice from the Italian sausage that's in it. And I went, okay, I'm not, I'm not thrilled about this yet. 
but then the one thing that he said to me, he said, you know, the, after tasting it, the flavors are starting to come back to me. Right, it's uh, developing a little bit more. Yeah, and I mean, I thought that, I thought, I mean, and that was eating one of the gnocchis by themselves. Yes. In the finished dish, let's talk about oh. the finished dish. Pet peeve. So, okay, so here was, uh, we would even maybe, I would maybe call this an issue or something like that with the recipe. Um, let's go from a flavor perspective. I thought the dish was not was not bland, but again, it needed acid. Needed it something. It needed vinegar. It needed something to bring that dish to life. It was all brown butter and a little bit of parm on top and these gnocchi, which had yeah. some flavor, but they weren't like exploding. Well, but let's, you know, let's take a step back too. Uh, the recipe calls for uh, butter and breadcrumbs. So basically, you're melting the bread, you're melting the butter, and tossing your breadcrumbs, you know, in the butter. Um, and both of us, you know, have have this as a pet peeve. When you look at the dish in the book, um, you you see something and you go, "That's not in the recipe." But there's a reason that it's in that picture. And something where, like we're saying, we put this on a plate and we're going, man, I'm, I'm, I need something to bring this, I need something to bring this to life. It, it needed, it needed more. And we're looking at it and we look at, and we look back at the picture and in the picture, there was very clearly brown butter that the gnocchi are sitting in. Yep. The amount of butter in the recipe, you use all of it to toast the given quantity of breadcrumbs. Correct. In the recipe. After we had toasted those, excuse me, those breadcrumbs, there was no butter left. Those breadcrumbs were dry right. and absorbed all of the butter. So there was nothing. So when we tossed the gnocchi with those breadcrumbs, the gnocchi were dry and coated in breadcrumbs. And in this picture, they're very clearly sitting in a little bit of brown butter. Yeah. So that was the first thing. Was like, okay, let's, let's take, we're going to take license here because it's in the picture. We're going to assume that they left it out of the recipe. Right. Whether you know, by, on, for, on purpose. By chance hey. or whatever. And, um, and so we said, okay, we're going to add brown butter. So we add brown butter, leaps and bounds better. Of course. And then we, and what then we it, taste what it. What isn't better with butter? I'm sorry. Brown butter. Brown, even brown butter, even better. Um, you know what Sarah goes crazy for is my brown butter popcorn. <laughs> Try that at home. Toss, brown, toss your popcorn and some brown butter, a little piment de espelette. Look that up. <laughs> uh, piment de espelette. And uh, a little bit of lime zest. It'll blow your mind. Anyway, back to the gnocchi. Back to gnocchi. Um, so we tossed the gnocchi in, in brown butter, and it was great. Uh, it wasn't great, but it was better. It was, it was, it was actually far better. And then uh, we got what we needed. Again. We got the footage that we needed. And then it was like, you know what? For, for kicks and giggles, we're, we're going to kick it up another notch. So we added a couple touches we re, to sherry vinegar. Uh, a couple t touches of sherry vinegar, oh. and then it just made it, it, everything it, pop. It made everything. I was, it wasn't sherry. It was Bliss Nine Year Maple Vinegar. Correct. Um, and, and it just it brought the dish to life. It brought everything together. I could taste all the components of the gnocchi. Yeah. Um, it just made everything again. Fan, just, acid, acid, acid. You guys will hear me say this week in week out. Yeah. Acid. As, acid, as we go through acid, these things, acid. you and. Again, coming from the, the home the home cook you know, perspective, uh, something that obviously he's drilled into my head is, um, you know, a taste your food along the way. B, you got to have that brightness, and and it and it brings things together, and it and it doesn't take a lot. Yeah, um, it's just developing your palate, learning to use salt, learning to use sugar, oh, even absolutely. in savory recipes, learning to use simple syrup, and learning to use acid. Uh, will make you, if you can learn to use salt, sugar, and acid in your cooking, both oh, savory just, and sweet, you, you take, will be you leaps it, and bounds yeah. better than 99% of people. Yep. Um, so that was, I would say uh, issues, what we would do differently, we talked about adding uh, a little bit of acid to the dish. I think that concludes cabbage gnocchi. Did we talk yeah. about the dough being loose? Actually, you know, here when we were, no, we didn't talk about it, but. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the dough. Um, I, I made the dough, and as we were going through it, I said, again, following the recipe directly, to me, without the, la the last step of adding, um, of completing the dough was adding the egg. 
And I thought that without the egg, that had the consistency of what I thought that dough should be. When I added the egg to it, I, I looked at that and went, there is no way on God's green earth that this is going to work. I, I thought it would became, it was, it was like, you know, it was, it was runny. It was, it was, it was I it wouldn't was say so, runny, it but was it loose. was, it was super loose. And the, and the recipe does say the dough will be loose. It yes, does say it, that. In all fairness, it does say that. It also says to chill the dough for two to 24 hours. Two to 24 hours. And we chilled it for two. We chilled it for a full two hours. Yes. I, we set a two hour timer. We did not cheat. It was it two, was two hours. hours. Um, and having said that, the next day we had a little leftover dough. It was set up very well. Yeah. If you've got the time and you're going to make this recipe, set it up overnight. Overnight. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so go, let's go back. So we used it after two hours and it was a little bit of a pain to work with. And this is where, uh, and it doesn't say this in the book, but I, I was. This I is keep, one of those professional tips that it, you're going to get right now. If it's a, if a recipe says working quickly, do this. That's code for this is going to suck, and it's going to be really difficult if you don't know what you're doing. Right. Um, and so working so, quickly, you add the dough uh, to flour, toss it around, shake off the excess, put them on a floured sheet. As they sit there, you see them start it, to lose just, their shape and flatten out. They just out. flatten out. And yeah. then it's like, and oh, not, come on. Not a lot, uh, but no. enough. Yeah, and, and again, it's one of those things that, like you said, you need... If I wasn't here... It's, it's one of those things that you, you need to work quickly with. It doesn't say that, but when, you're, when you pick up a spoon and you drop it in and you're going, holy cow, and you're trying to gently get some flour around it to make this... You know, it says to roll. Yes, yeah, it says to roll it in your hands. You need to gently just. Oh, it's, it, you don't think about making a ball. Yeah, yeah not, you can't roll it. Yeah, it's not like making a cookie ball. Yeah, you know exactly. Which I think people will think that's what they're yes. supposed to do. Um, so and absolutely not the case. Yeah, absolutely not the case. So um, I would consider that a little bit of an issue. Uh, let it go for twenty four hours. You if you've should, got the time. Yeah. If you've got the time, at least two. <laughs> You're gonna make your life a nightmare if you don't go if, to. If you try, if you try to just mix the dough and go straight to it, not gonna work. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll make that prediction. It's not gonna work. Yeah, and it, like I said, it does say the the dough will be loose. So we're not calling Mark really out here on anything. Just know that you might. This is one of the more challenging recipes if you're not the quickest right. cook. And 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 I'm not. So, but let me tell you, I learned very quick to be to move very quick. Um, so why don't you uh, talk to them about the eggplant rotolo while I reset the cameras? Oh, okay. <laughs> Beer break. Yes, have some. Starting off, it's a uh, what is a rotolo? So the best way to describe that is a it's a pasta roll up. It's like a it's like a cake roll. It's almost it, like a cake. It's like a it like a. <laughs> is it? You can't do that. I go to. It's, it's, like, it's, a, it's, it's like, like a rolled up lasagna. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, you 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 have your your you have your pasta sheet, and then you put you put your cream, and then you put your your a uh, little bit of sauce. You put your cheese in, and you basically roll it up. You cut them into you know, pinwheels. was it pinwheels? Thank you. And then you put your pinwheels in a baking dish with sauce, cheese on top, bake it up. So and to me, I thought I thought it tasted good. I. I but I will say this. Again, the eggplant needs help. Okay. I think what, for me, what brought this dish to life was the sauce that it was in. That's why I thought it was, that's why I thought it was good. All right, so here's my perspective on this. <laughs> this was here's the, the 180 degree version of it. This was the video that I, uh, that I cooked. And I did not like this dish. I thought it was flavorless. Um, and as a chef, there were adjustments that I wanted to make, but we agreed to cook the recipes exactly as they were in the book. Yeah. So we did not, we did not We do took that. no liberties. Um, and I think the biggest culprit was the eggplant, as he said. Um, the eggplant was what was flavorless. We, we put the dough down, um, eggplant puree, I think there was cheese on top of that, yeah. and then rolled it up. Um... And I just think the eggplant puree was flavorless, in my opinion. Uh, again, 
acid, 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 acid. <laughs> um, what, what I what you you roast the eggplant in the oven with uh, olive oil. I think there was thyme, uh, thyme. Yes, thyme. And garlic on mm -hmm. top, maybe. Um, Black pepper. And uh, I, I, in my opinion. Uh, it needed a little bit of vinegar on there or something else to, to just to bring it to life. And I'm just checking. I want to make sure I was still recording because I, I felt something there. <laughs> I'm getting very Sorry, guys. I, I'm getting very nervous about the, the cameras switching off and, 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 and Mike's and, turning and tying off. It on so, off and, so, yeah. so sorry about that. We'll get those fixed out uh, as the weeks progress and we do more and more of these. We'll get more yeah. co comfortable with the equipment that we have. Um, so... Uh, bear, with, bear with us for a couple, uh, just for couple while we get this worked out. Yeah, first episode, growing <laughs> pains. Yes. Um, so the eggplant, uh, the eggplant, um, at, at a restaurant that I worked at, we did an eggplant puree where we took uh, capers, shallot, balsamic, olive oil, and I think roasted garlic, and and we scored the eggplant, cross-hatched it, and then smeared that into it, and then roasted it, and then pureed the roasted eggplant that had so all those things on it, that was tasty. Well, so if you think about that, you, you're, you, have, this, you have this flat piece. Um, almost like, imagine a piece of wood. And now you, you're cutting holes into it, basically, and you're putting stuff in these holes, and you're kind of infusing those flavors into that, uh, into that eggplant, and, and that's what it needs. And yeah, like I said... I, uh, and I'm coming at this from a, uh, a high a high level, and I'm I'm not gonna give these chefs any liberty in their recipes. I think the book is great. Don't get me wrong. We'll get to that. We'll yeah. get to what I think about the book as a whole. But this particular recipe, acid, 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 acid. And here's where I let Mark off the hook. Um, not that he'll ever see this. Not that he would even care. So <laughs> what's the difference? But. Um, now, you, now you know somebody's gonna send it to him. You know that, I'll send right? It to him. Oh, well, I'm gonna tweet this at him. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna make sure he sees this. But will he watch it? Who knows? Mark, if you're out there and you watch this, I would love for you to reply. Um, oh, absolutely. And, that, and that's not calling you out. That's just I'd love to know if you saw. Yeah. It. Um, but and here's 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 the thing that I will totally give him leeway with. In all of the recipes, I would say all of the recipes, but in in. Actually, I just saw another one where he says it, and let me just look at another one. In a lot of these recipes, he says, adjust the seasoning to taste with salt and pepper until it tastes good to you. Yeah. And I think that's the most important thing that anybody can tell. It's one of the most important things that anybody can tell you. Yeah. Season the food so that it tastes good to you. If a recipe says quarter teaspoon of salt and it's too salty, oh, at that point, back it you, off. You, you, yeah, well, you at that point, really there's not, the, there's not much you with, can do. Yeah, you'll have, well, you can, there's but things that you can do, but. Uh, most, most books or most recipes, if they say put in a quarter teaspoon, they underestimate how much salt us, they they're, they're just, uh, they're estimating, a quarter teaspoon is kind of code for a pinch in a right. book. And let me tell you, my pinch of salt is way different than your pinch of salt, I guarantee you. Uh, a pinch of salt is a lot of salt yes. uh, in, a, in a restaurant. And that's not because we're trying to kill you. It's because we know how to make food taste good. Right. And that doesn't mean that food doesn't taste good without salt. But salt does bring out flavor. And there is, a line, there is a line where things become too salty. And it's important sure. to know how to make the, your food taste good to you yeah. and he does say that in the book yeah. um so going forward with all these recipes uh you know i think they're great i will of course continue to taste 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 which everybody should do as they cook taste 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 uh and adjust and then taste again um i will adjust with acid because yeah. i feel that <laughs> all these recipes need acid yeah. um other than that i thought the recipe was great everything worked um actually the the blanching of the dough sheets very difficult it wasn't that it was difficult it hurt <laughs> um so <laughs> what, a, okay what the, um, the book tells you to do is to roll the pasta sheets out and put them uh, between uh parchment paper or towels and then Blanch them in boiling water to briefly cook them, um, so to par-cook them before baking the pasta. And he tells you to take them out of the water, 
uh, you know, not necessarily with your hands using a spoon or tongs or whatever, um, but then when you try to maneuver them and blanch all these sheets, it was hot. It was hot. Okay, now, so, mind you, mind you, home cooks like you and I, most people watching this, um, we still have feeling in our fingers. I don't have feeling in my fingers. And, and I can tell and, you, and I will say, most, it was hot. most chefs you run across are, you know, impervious to, to pain anymore. <laughs> and, and, and let me tell you, it was hot. It was hot. And so I sit and I'm looking at this and I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I did one. I burned my fingers for you people. I burned my <laughs> fingers for you guys because it said to do it in the book and I did it for you guys. Um, after, so I did that once and then I said, this is not going to make any difference. I know it and I'm not going to lose my identity um, blanching these yeah. sheets. So after it came out of the uh, boiling water, I dunked it in an ice bath for just a, sh a second, yeah. literally just to shock it so that it was manageable and I could touch the dough comfortably with my hands. So we did take a little bit of a liberty there. So don't think that you can't make adjustments. Uh, and I would say cooks out there, home cooks, when the sheets come out of the water, just give them a quick run through some ice, uh, through an ice water bath and uh, save, some, save your fingerprints. All right, let's... Uh... Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Yeah, you you go ahead and start. Uh, let's re so, you go ahead and recap, and I will do cameras. Um, okay. All right. So, um, final impressions of the book. For me, I love the book. Uh, I, I I can't I can't say anything bad about this. Uh, I can't say anything bad about this book. Um, I it is it is a book that I think um, anybody everybody can, should own. Um, again, recipes, in, in my opinion, language, very easy to follow. Uh, the recipes that we made, I, I, I was impressed. Uh, you, you could pick up a book along, uh, again, this is why we're doing this. You pick up a book off a shelf and you go, how do I know if this is going to be any good? Well, that's why we're here. We're here to kind of try to help you uh, decipher some of this stuff and help you along the way. I can't say enough good things about this book. Um, uh, if you're if you're a beginner wanting to learn pasta, this is a great book. If you're if you're a you know a seasoned chef, great book. Uh, my thoughts on the book. Um, I def again acid acid acid. Sure, but. Uh, I think it's a great book. I think a lot of people at home are going to learn a, 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 a You're gonna learn a lot. skill. Oh, absolutely. Uh, making pasta is super simple. I do it with kids all the time uh, in the cooking classes that I teach. Um, I, I do pasta with kids all the time. It's something really easy. I'll have them make a dough um, just in case. I'll make a batch ahead of time um, in case this doesn't necessarily turn out. And poof, a little TV magic. Uh, look, Johnny, it was great. Um... And then the kids take turns rolling it through the pasta machine. Um, and then, you know, even if they're picky eaters, just throw it in some tomato sauce um, and put cheese on it if they like it. Um, even even I, the butter noodles. Yeah, butter noodles. Um, making pasta is an invaluable skill that, um, you know, you can use for quick night, oh, and quick I'm, I, and I, night I, dinners. You can do for date nights. You can do to impress your friends. This, this book goes so far as to tell you how you can make pasta, preserve it, um, it, make ahead of time and and keep it. It's um, okay, again you can freeze it, pasta. Oh, absolutely! It, it is invaluable, and I'm going to tell you that there isn't a. I believe, and I f firmly believe this. There is nothing that you can't make at home that doesn't taste better than anything you buy in a store. Well, I mean, I do like liquid cheese out of a can. Well, <laughs> yeah, and there goes my credibility <laughs> totally. But I do love some 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 liquid but, cheese. But but again, cheese. the the uh, the pasta is just one of those things that a fresh homemade pasta, I'm telling you, try it once, you'll be hooked. Yeah. Um, 
Again, can't say enough great things about the book. The quality of the book, uh, from a physical standpoint, the book was great. It's going to last a long time. Absolutely. Mr. Uh, Vetri, two thumbs up. Two thumbs up, sir. Hats off to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, I love the lay flat binding. I when, Especially when cookbooks don't go with a lay flat binding. It drives me freaking bonkers because you got to find something to put on top of the book yeah. to keep it from or make a copy of the recipe. Um, and that's actually a little tip for you, for you guys out there. Um, if you don't... If you're afraid of damaging your cookbooks or spilling something on it, make a photocopy if you have a scanner at home of the recipe and have that in your kitchen. Oh, uh, you should see you should see half of our cookbook. We write in them, we do everything. Take notes in your book. That's what they're for. Yeah, also take yeah, take notes in the book. Uh, if something didn't work out the first time, make, make a note, note of it. Uh, so you know for next time. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, photo quality, great. Uh, recipes, great. Uh, storytelling uh, perspective. Um, Fantastic. Um, Definitely. Explains more than you've ever wanted to know about pasta. Here they're talking about gluten quantity and quality. Right. And there is... uh, There's actually a DNA sample of... of of gluten in there. Yeah, uh, or I think this is a wheat, two different it's a wheat strand. varieties. So as much as you could possibly imagine or ever need or didn't want to know about pasta. It's in here. It's in this book. Um, so hats off to you, Mark. I think that's, that's going to be it for this week. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like, if you like what you see, you like what we do, um, please go ahead and like this video, remember to comment on it and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on all of our latest videos. That's it up, yeah. Welcome to Flavorbound Beer Bites. So, thank you guys uh, for sticking around. If you guys are watching this, chances are you've stuck around after our episode. Uh, this one being the uh, review of Mastering Pasta by Mark Vetri. Uh, so, thanks for sticking around. Uh, today, we are drinking a very, very special beer. Uh, this beer is called Big Hugs. This is a Russian Imperial Stout with coffee, uh, brewed by Half Acre Beer Company out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, Consequently, where we are from. <laughs> where we are from. Uh, and, and let's talk about that. So the availability of this beer is extremely limited, which is why uh, this is a special beer to have today and a very special show for us. Um, this was review number one for us. So. Yeah. So we wanted to. Pull we needed to kick it up a notch. Wanted to pull something special out yeah. of the cellar. Uh, this beer is released one day a year, and that's Big Hugs Day at uh, Half Acre Beer Company. It's brewed with a coffee by another, uh, another Chicago company called Dark Matter Coffee, which is a coffee roaster that I absolutely love, and that is the espresso that I drink in my home. Uh, and, it, and I also uh, buy their coffee beans for drip. Um, I, uh, I, love, uh, ha- um, I love Half Acre, and I love uh, Dark Matter. They both do a great job. And, uh, they, I mean, there's a half acre makes a lot of good beers, though. They, I mean, they really do. Um, Daisy Cutter, Daisy, Daisy Cutter is, I, I will say this I am, I, I know everybody, a lot of people, they love their IPAs, they love the IPA thing. Um, and a lot of people don't even know what an IPA is. Let's, let's be honest. Well, I think people they know it's it's a hoppy beer, uh, but, I but they, they don't might, might they don't the understand origin. exactly. They don't understand the origin. They don't know what goes into it. They just know, oh well, that's what everybody drinks. So when they go into a place, they go, oh, I'll have an IPA, whatever that is. Um, but Daisy Cutter, absolutely, oh, one of my favorites. Super I'm telling you, just tropical, oh, citrus, just just fresh. You it's, you pop that can and it's just. Oh, it just it just hits you. But they it do, just hits the nose. They do so many other great uh, Chub Step Porter, um, Space IPA. Um, I think it's called Chocolate Camaro is the other one. Um, I, they do tons of beers that are just phenomenal, awesome. And uh, and we're lucky because they're in our backyard. So yeah, they are. And uh, Dark Matter. Uh, my girlfriend and I we go to Dark Matter on Sundays uh, when I need espresso beans. We'll go there. And uh, have a have a ham and cheese croissant, and um, you know listen to you know hip hop, and you know they they, they put up local art, um, and they do different uh, artists collab um, projects for their bags and their labeling. Tiny little place too. Yeah, um, it's a local 
stayed small. You know, they're not intelligentsia yet putting, you know, stuff in, you know, sure. every store and whatever. They're staying, staying small for right now. But they do a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Um, so that is, that's, you know, kind of the history behind Big Hugs. Uh, Big Hugs Day is an awesome event. It takes place, I believe it's on December 13th. Uh, it's very early in December. Um, you line up as early as you can in the morning. Uh, last year I was second person in line. Um, and the year before that I was the first person in line. And, uh, and I will not share what time I got there because <laughs> I will continue to be the first person in line. Just know it was very early. <laughs> and uh, should you meet me at uh, Big Hugs Day, I am happy to share a brew with you. Um, and the day itself, they're so gracious. Is the thing, it, beer releases that I've been to, KBS, um, Dark Lord, uh, Big Hugs, uh, some Goose Island releases... Uh, certainly Surely. darkness, um, they're great. I can't say that all of them show the support for their customers that Half Acre does. Um, on Big Hugs Day, they gave <coughs> free donuts and coffee to everybody in line. And then Half Acre, as a special gift to those of us who were very uh, close and devoted. Up front, <laughs> uh, uh, devoted is a good uh, adjective. Uh, were there and braving the cold very early in the morning. Um, they gave us uh, a 2013, this is a 2014 Big Hugs, they gave us a bottle of 2013 and a bottle of 2012 Big Hugs, thanks for standing in the cold. And Dark Matter gave us each a pound of coffee and a t-shirt on top of the free coffee and donuts throughout the day. No other place is going to do that yeah. for you. Um, so I can't say enough good things about uh, Half Acre Big Hugs. Big Hugs Day, um, Dark Matter Coffee, um, all you guys do a great job. You treat your customers very well, and we appreciate that. Trust me. Um, so let's dive into the beer uh, specs. It is a uh, 10% ABV uh, is what I found. I don't know if that's actually printed uh, on the bottle. Actually, this one says it, yeah, it is 10%. That's what I found online. Um, IBUs, International bitter, Bitterness Units, uh, unknown, does not say on the bottle. Um, it is a 1.6 fluid ounce bottle. Um, the style is a Russian Imperial Stout with coffee. Um, and if there's one extra little thing about this beer, it is that it has a secret label. It has a secret label behind it. It has a secret... Big hug. Little label of big can... hugs. <laughs> you guys can see that. It has a secret little label. And if you can't see it, the, the kitty cat, well, the, the one kitty cat, the one that's alive, actually. He's it, drinking a tiki drink. He's, tiki, <laughs> he's a, a tiki drink, and then the skeleton cat, would, uh, more, more the you know, Grim he's Reaper. He's kind of like chilling. He's, a, you know, the Grim Reaper there. He's got his skull mug, you know. It's <laughs> so, kind of funny. Uh, yeah, so pretty cool there. Awesome label. Um, they always do a really cool job with all of their uh, label yeah. art. Uh, big hugs labels. I love them every year. <clears throat> Um, so let's dive into the beer. So let's, uh, talk about the aroma. Oh, chocolatey, uh, chocolatey, you know, chocolatey it's coffee, just, co it's even like but caramely. It, yeah, a little bit. caramely. The malts are coming through. So for 2014, oh. the malts are coming through in this a lot more than the coffee. Um, I say that, uh, I, earlier this year I had a 2012. Oh man, I had a, some bright fruit in there. You know, almost oh. like a. Oh, almost like a dark cherry, you know? Yeah, almost. Like, yeah, oh. a dark cherry, I would say, is a really good descriptor. Yeah. It's got... Oh, uh, man, you get that... You it's, really, it around. it's really developed as it's warmed up, but I'll say even... Um, I'm not getting as much coffee as I thought I would have from 2014 being, fr you know, uh, fresh uh, this year's... Uh, See, you, you know, know I, I do. I smell that coffee in I there. I it. really get it. I get it, but I don't get it like I do Bourbon County coffee or something like that. Okay, that's a, that's a whole different level there, though. No, it's not. It's, I, it, this is this is a release of the uh, same caliber. I, it's not the same beer. Bourbon County coffee is definitely uh, a more intense beer. But, you know, as it, as it does warm up, you get a little bit more. You get some uh, citrus notes in there, though. Oh, even, yeah. There's something just peeking through in there that's I, really nice. Again, I it, it, uh, you get the, a little bit of spicy, but I still think there's that... Uh, again, that, 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 that cherry, fruit. yeah, it's that fruit, but I think it's more of the, 
It is. A, it's a. It's a. It's a heavy. A heavy cherry, like a. If you would think like a chocolate covered cherry, that's what I smell. Yeah. Um. Again, I so as far as the coffee though, um, with this, I'm surprised I don't smell. Uh, I don't get a little bit more of it in the nose. Um, drinking a 2012, probably like two months ago, there was still a lot of coffee left in it. So to see that there's not as much in this is uh, in this one is interesting. But um, I don't know. How about the taste? There it is. There's that coffee. Absolutely. You know what? Coffee. As it as it chocolate. warms as it warms up, coffee. First note. Second note. Chocolate. Finish. Third. I get I get that little bit of fruit. fruit. I yeah, get that I was, fruit. I was waiting for you to say I, it. I really. get it. And then, just you know that there's a balance. The ba uh, coating the tongue. It's a super balanced beer. Coating not, the tongue. Just. It's not like. Like lip smacking, tacky, sweet. It's not an overly sweet beer. Some of these um, higher alcohol beers, Russian Imperial Stouts with coffee, these darker beers. It, I would say, you know, and in, in the I would say the finish on this semi dry. It's it's not dry to me. I would call it more of a semi dry. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, it, it, with it, that. I mean, yeah. if you if you think of it in terms of a wine, you have your sweets, your semi dries, and your yeah just got awful dry. I think this falls into that semi-dry category. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but just a pleasant bitterness uh, to the finish as well, and, and that fruit. I'm um, getting chocolate again. Um, just a really well balanced beer, really well crafted. If oh. you guys can make it out to Big Hugs Day, I, I you're not going to be disappointed uh, waiting out there with me again, in the and, cold. And, yeah, and again, this is not something that you could just go to the store and pick up. This is a specialty release that you need. You need to be. Um, at Half Acre 4, or if you're lucky enough and um, you can trade you somebody trade for, trade it. for it. Yeah. Um, but that, again, very rare. and uh, We're lucky to have it. Yeah, we're lucky. So final thoughts, great beer. Um, if, if you can head out to Big Hugs this day again, do it. But uh, that's really all I got in this. That's all I got. We like Half Acre. We, we do like Half Acre. <laughs> and we like Dark Matter. Thank you guys. Thank you for being awesome to your customers. And uh, Nostrovia. Nostrovia.